I'm holding in my hand tonight a brilliant and innovative first issue of a new literary, well, it's a complete arts journal, the New York Arts Journal. We're talking tonight with the editor of the New York Arts Journal, Richard Bergen. Thank you for being here tonight, Richard. Thank you very much for having me. Be before we begin discussing the issue, I'd like to say that Richard Bergen is the author of Conversations with Jorge Luis Borges. It's been translated into five languages and uh, also the author of a work of fiction, The Man with Missing Parts. He's former critic at large and columnist for the Boston Globe. He has put together what is just a phenomenal first issue of what's going to be a very, very important and successful arts journal. It combines fiction, poetry, book reviews, essays, photography, art reviews, and reproductions of artwork with some of the leading names in America in, in the field of uh, journalism and the arts. Well, I'm overwhelmed by those <laughs> I'm overwhelmed words, with I should the magazine. say. Well, Let's thank you. Let's just quickly can I say? run through a list of some of the people in this first issue. You have a number of uh, National Book Award winners, do you not, or former? Yeah, and Pulitzer Prize, whatever. Yeah. Douglas Davis on art politics? He's not one of them. <laughs> but no, <laughs> he is who? Well, he uh, is art editor of Newsweek, and he's... Uh, I guess that's how he's best known to the general public. Uh, he um, is, however, a serious critic and theoretician of art who's uh, written a number of uh, books on various problems of contemporary art. We have John Cage, one of the leading... Well, John authors. Cage has probably been for the last 15 or 20 years the most uh, influential of the... Uh, so-called avant-garde composers in American music, yeah. And just to go through the list first, oh, and then sure. we'll come back to them. Oh, uh, sure. Who else? Uh, Give us a complete rundown well, of who is in this first issue. Rob Grier is, is uh, I don't, I'm about to resort to a cliche, which I've tried. <laughs> <laughs> which I never feel too good about doing, but he is, uh, by something like general critical consensus, considered uh, France's most uh, renowned novelist, living novelist. Uh, he's the author of uh, such books translated into English as Jealousy, The Erasers, The Voyeur, Project for a Revolution in the Labyrinth. He collaborated with uh, uh, Alain René in Last Year in Marienbad, a very well-known film which may be the project uh, by which he's known to the largest number of people of, uh, in this country. And uh, I should say, perhaps at this point, um, and we might get back to this later in terms of the general aims of the magazine. Right, let's just, we can go through the... Okay, well, I, I should say that, that part of the uh, interview, which was originally conducted in French and then translated, uh, he talks about his latest project with, with uh, Rauschenberg, Robert Rauschenberg. Oh, really? They're collaborating together in a book of fiction and text. That's in this issue? No, well, he discusses that en passant, one might say, <laughs> yeah, in the course of the interview, yeah. And then the photographs by? Well, Dwayne Michaels is um, uh, certainly a very well known photographer, and I think deservedly so. Uh, and Dwayne uh, Michaels has uh, given us two uh, very fine photographs. You might call them photo stories because he combines uh, narrative with the photographic image, which is the kind of uh, work that uh, Dwayne is into now. Uh, you have poetry, too, by uh, John by, Updike. By John Updike, and there's your National Book Award winner and your Pulitzer Prize winner, and Robert Bly who also won a National Book Award. And um, David Shapiro, who's won a number of awards. He was nominated for a National Book Award while we're on the subject of awards. Uh, but uh, 
In other words, a very impressive list. Uh, an impressive list, uh, but also some of our strongest pieces uh, come from people uh, who are largely unknown. Uh, many of our writers were young, and virtually all of the people who put this thing together were, uh, are under uh, 30 years of age, except for the designer who's in his early 30s. <laughs> so. Um, it's, One of it's, those old over thirties. <laughs> well, it's uh, what I what I what I meant to say basically, uh, without meaning to really explore in any kind of depth the problem of ageism. Uh, oh, to I what degree that it. surfaced into mass consciousness, I'm not certain. But uh, in other words, it's uh, it's open. It's young. an open publication. Uh, yeah. We we don't care if people are over thirty five or under thirty five any more than we care. Uh, and I mentioned this in the editorial points, you know, with the people who matter women. We're not really interested in what genitals people wear under their belts. We're interested in the, the quality of material they're able to produce. And uh, you'll find a number of poets and critics uh, who are deserving of wider attention existing with the so-called superstars and so the realms of literature, music, and art. You're Adam. open. This is what I yeah. wanted to get to. You say in your... Uh, editorial that the arts overlap and especially today they literally do overlap theater music visual arts and literature and secondly the your journal will attempt to achieve a balance between worthwhile creative achievement and critical reflection yeah finally that it's your intention to be as open a publication as possible so that you mean you're open to material uh, right. writing any in the arts by anyone yeah, if I could maybe just see this for one second so I can see my, what was uh, written. Yeah, I, I did say uh, in, in, in the last paragraph, it is our intention to be as open a publication as possible, which means naturally that we have no quotas on men, women, minorities, people over or under 35, uh, etc. But also, that was meant tongue in cheek, that we are open to different styles of imaginative or critical work. I think Nabokov, said it best, there is only one school, a school of talent. What so, makes your magazine different from okay. other publications? Well. <laughs> Some people might confuse it with the New York Review of Books. Well, OK. Uh, to respond to your first question, my chauvinistic impulse <laughs> is to say, show me one that's like it. <laughs> but but um, that is terribly chauvinistic. Uh, as for the New York Review of Books, maybe I'll return to question one. <laughs> First, if, we want, if you want to explore that. Uh, the New York Review of Books essentially took the New York uh, uh, Sunday Times book review section during the printer strike back in the 60s, which was able to launch them uh, really uh, commercially, and uh, elevated it to a more intellectual or certainly more academic level. And then they f threw in some political articles. But it, uh, um, but it basically took advantage of the printer strike in the New York Times because the publishing companies had no markets to advertise their books. So uh, the New York Review was, was a real necessity for. And it and doesn't deal also in, in photographs. No, it has nothing to do art with art whatsoever. This is an arts magazine. We're not into uh, politics, radical chic, sincere or otherwise. We're not, there are many other publications that are doing an excellent job. And I think the New York Review, for what it does, uh, does do an excellent job. Uh, their audience is basically academic, basically university oriented. 80% um, of, the, of uh, the people who read them get it through the mail. It's universities, university libraries. And do they it, read it when they get it through the mail? Yeah, I think so. I think it's the most uh, influential uh, literary magazine in the yeah, country, I do most too. likely. I, I'm, I'm joking there. But uh, it's, uh, again, it's about criticism. It's not about art, and which is why I also say in the very brief editorial points, there's never tr truly been an age of criticism. That was alluding to a remark by poet Randall Jarrell back in the 50s. There's never truly been an age of criticism, any more than there's been an age of art without criticism. And that's what I meant when I said I was trying to achieve a balance between criticism and so-called creative work, although we all know that in a certain sense, serious criticism, such as you get in Douglas Davis's piece on art politics, can be a creative act. Are you open to all points of artistic view in, in this? Are, are you trying to promote a point of view? Or are you? No. 
Absolutely trying to be not. as diverse as possible in points of view. Absolutely not. That's what I meant when I said that we're open to different styles of imaginative and critical work, and that's what I meant when I quoted Vladimir Nabokov or Nabokov, depending upon how you want to attempt a, the pronunciation of his Russian last name. Uh, and that's by saying there's only one school, the school of talent. Uh, I believe that. I, uh, you know, uh, we have uh, artwork by an uh, extraordinarily talented artist, Don Gray, who did the cover, uh, which I believe is in the Allen Stone Gallery. And he did uh, some pieces inside. Well, it's right on the cover, dude. Oh, I know. <laughs> I, was, I was looking yeah. inside. I yeah. think they Yeah, well, we it. also have, uh, he also illustrates the uh, art politics piece by Douglas Davis. and. Uh, I don't know uh, how uh, one would actually describe Don's work, whether it's uh, uh, realistic symbolism, a symbolic realism, or <laughs> maybe we'll leave that to the critics of the future. But uh, now that's quite different uh, than, let's say, the uh, artwork of Ed Baynard and Arlene Slavin, which you might uh, turn to. Arlen Slavin is a, does, does abstract uh, work, uh, somewhat in the spirit of abstract expressionists, and Ed Baynard's into something else. Again, I don't know how well the Baynard will show up on TV. And that's Arlene's work, and that's Ed Baynard. So that's obviously a very different style. And I already showed the Dwayne Michaels, where narrative is combined with the photographic image. Right, at the beginning. Okay, so. Uh, the fiction, the two stories we have, the one by George Stade, you might say uh, its spiritual progenitor is, uh, is Dostoevsky and has filtered through uh, many other writers who, you know, we all came under, uh, Dostoevsky used to say uh, of his Russian contemporaries, we all came under Gogol's undercoat and really, uh, or maybe he said overcoat, <laughs> but, so, but without Dostoevsky, there wouldn't be any modern right. literature. There wouldn't be Camus or Sartre or, or Kafka. Or, uh, they all studied him and read him. And or there wouldn't be any moving into a 20th century American fiction. Uh, there wouldn't be any Norman Mailer or Saul Bellow. And I think State is more in that kind of realist tradition with a kind of underground man, that term that Dostoevsky coined and made famous. Uh, sensibility. So he's kind of into that thing. Now, Jonathan Baumbach, who's involved with Fiction Collective, is more of an experimental writer. Now, I happen to be crazy about those stories, so. And they're included in this issue. Yeah, that's, that's, that's basically what I'm saying. I think you really limit yourself when you get into a kind of cause mentality because you just shut off so much. Do of, you have of what's an, an article, I believe you do, on that very thing as art politics I'm thinking of? Do I? Or in the, in the issue? No, I don't. No, I don't. On shutting yourself or, or deciding on a particular point of view? Uh, what is, could you describe art politics? Let's put the question. I mean, the Douglas Davis article. The Douglas Davis article in this issue. It might be a very provocative <laughs> article. Yeah, uh, I, I'm expecting a response world. from. <laughs> well, why don't I read you a couple of paragraphs? Okay, from fine. It. Um, and I may not even begin at the beginning. Um, because this is a very scholarly and brilliant article. It's going to appear in his new book, uh, uh, Hopper and Rowe will publish uh, this fall. Um, well, my goodness, I don't, it would take at least four paragraphs to even begin to get the reader into this. <laughs> uh, well, basically, art politics is a reaction to Okay. Um, although Robert Morris has lately been telling us that we are living through a period in which the private sensibility has taken precedence over the public, in the October Art Forum, he wrote that artists are now, quote, deeply skeptical of experiences beyond the body of participating in any public art enterprise. I myself can't recall a time when the politics of art were so openly and heatedly discussed. There is an irony in this situation which I will leave for you to ponder. My present purpose leads me on to something else. There are two incidents that have triggered these discussions which are being carried on wherever I go, and both of them concern Art Forum magazine. I apologize for this emphasis, but it is as inevitable as the importance of similar incidents might be for the stockbrokers and the Wall Street Journal, a Kremlinologist, and Pravda. First, there was a Lin Linda Benglis incident last spring, to which I'll refer later. Second, there is a recent reaction to the now infamous political issue of Art Forum in the fall. Um, 
please believe that it is only the reaction that concerns me now, not the specific value and non-value of that issue. Um, what happened at ARC Forum? Well, all right, yeah, we'll skip a little bit ahead, uh, our perceptive of you, because uh, uh, it would be a little bit too long to read the whole thing. Um, uh, first, he's talking about ARC Forum's critics. I think I can sum this up in two quick paragraphs. Let me remind you of the basic point. He's talking about Hilton Kramer's criticism of the, of the direction the magazine was taking and David Borden and the Village Voice. Let me remind you of the basic point made by each writer. Kramer, of course, is that critic in the New York Times. Kramer argued that Kozloff, who was one of the editors of Art Forum, and Copeland's another one, were hypocrites for turning upon the art uh, system that nurtured and fed them. Borden ended his long and discursive attack by charging the most heinous of sins, that Art Forum no longer cares about art, that his persistent emphasis on sordid political issues blinds us to the art on the walls. These are dated remarks, granted, but they have been said. They are in front of us naked and glistening. Um, you will know why I consider this invective so significant when I finish. Uh, these incidents and the discussions they have provoked are far more politically significant than the anti-war movement, movement within the art world in the middle and late 60s. Why? Because they force us to examine themselves. He goes on and on. You asked what the Alinda Benglis uh, incident was. I can sum this up in one final paragraph. The early Alinda Benglis incident had three parts. An article by Robert Pincus Wint Witten, excuse me, on the work of Linda ben Benglis, a large full color photograph of the nude Ms. Benglis laid out as an advertisement in another section of the magazine. This is an art forum. Right. Holding a giant dildo between her legs and a long, somber letter to the editor signed by five of Art Forum's editors themselves, protesting the publication of this object of extreme vulgarity. Beneath the surface of this scenario runs an habitual course of art world behavior that I propose to isolate and define. Let us focus on a section of the letter signed by Lawrence Alloway, Max Kozloff, Rosalind Krauss, these are all art world heavies, I don't have to identify, Joseph uh, Meshek and Annette, Annette Michelson that has been scarcely noticed. The advertisement, this is from the Art Forum 5, who protested the advertisement in their own magazine, which they nevertheless published. The advertisement has pictured the journal's role as, of, as devoted to the self-promotion of artists in the most debased sense of the term. We are aware of the economic interdependencies which govern the entire chain of artistic production and distribution. Nonetheless, the credibility of our work demands that we be always on guard against such complicity, implied by the publication of this advertisement. To our great regret, we find ourselves compromised in this manner and that we owe our readers an acknowledgment of that compromise. The incident, this incident is deeply symptomatic of conditions that call for critical analysis. As long as they infect the reality around us, these conditions shall have to be treated in our future work as writers and as, and as editors. Let me just finish this. I'm almost over. Simply as an experiment and to get the movement of my thought and this essay going off to a quick start, I propose freely to translate this section of the letter into direct language colored by my own entirely biased interpretation of the inferences that lurk behind the words as follows. Okay, so first we get the official apology and sense of outrage of the art form editors for publishing this advertisement, purient advertisement. Now, here's Douglas Davis's interpretation of what he thinks they really made looking at it behind the words. This advertisement makes it seem as though the space in this art magazine is for sale to artists and their dealers. Certainly we know that everything in the art world is for sale, including ourselves, but our reputations will suffer if we aren't careful, at least in public. The dildo ad forces us to justify our association with, the, with this profit-making art system to you, the readers. This incident proves that the capitalist system of making, publicizing, and selling art ought to be criticized by somebody. If the system doesn't watch out or reform itself, we will have to do the criticizing ourselves, and Lord knows we don't look forward to it. <laughs> so you can see this is a potentially, uh, it's a brilliant scholarly piece. You don't have to agree with it uh, uh, necessarily, but it's, it's very this scholarly. This is Douglas Davis of Newsweek. It's sure to create an issue. Uh, and Taking issue with Art Forum's objection yeah. to their own advertisement and also to an editorial they promoted about well, it examines the whole relationship between politics and art, and I know there's no time to get into this. It's just too complicated to reduce to a minute or two minutes. It, this is a magazine that should be read and thought about as well as looked at. It is attractive, I think, and uh, doesn't look like anything else, but uh, it should be read and thought about, just as John Cage's interview should be, and Ro or Rob Grier's, or Bombeck and Stade's fiction, or Robert Bly and John Updike and David Shapiro's poetry. This is, uh, uh, as far as I know, the only magazine in New York, at low price, 75 cents, coming out six times a year, that really addresses itself to 
the interrelationship of the arts, how they obliquely or overtly influence each other, how they overlap, and what's going on not only in New York, but actually all over the country. But of course, we all feel New York is in the center part of our activity. And also, it's a more open magazine in that it's not closed. No, to there aren't. No, we, 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 uh, we don't have any uh, clubs in that sense. No, that, that wouldn't uh, do a magazine. We want to say this is now going on. It's it's on sale really now at, at better bookstores and newsstands, yeah. Throughout New York City and? And in Boston, and it will be in California, and it's going through the mail. And response so far has been very good. Uh, we'll also be at the New York Book Fair at Lincoln Center on Friday. And, um, well, why don't you give people the address? Well, <laughs> I want you to. I was okay, it's, uh, if anyone uh, wants to subscribe, it's $4 for six issues. Uh, and it's, uh, the address is New York Arts Journal, 560 Riverside Drive, New York, New York, 10027. But checks must be made payable to Manhattan Arts Review, Inc. Okay? So that's New York Arts Journal, 560 Riverside Drive, New York, New York, 10027. Also, they'll be able to get, buy it in many art galleries. They'll be, able to, uh, they'll be able to get it at art galleries, at bookstores, literary and art bookstores, because it's of interest to, to musicians, artists, and writers, and at newsstands throughout the city. We have about five minutes left. Oh, I didn't know, my in, dear. <laughs> I, I thought, in I closing, I would like to ask you, <laughs> and, what yeah. led you to launch such an ambitious and very successful first issue? <laughs> and, future issues? Well, uh, I felt there was a need for it uh, for any uh, number of reasons. I felt the job wasn't being done, uh, not to say that there aren't other excellent magazines, but... You had your own idea? Of yeah, as I say, there, there isn't a magazine that on a serious level, and that doesn't mean it isn't exciting or lively or provocative, uh, that it's really very provocative, that I addresses would say. <laughs> itself to issues in the arts. There simply isn't. There are lots of academic magazines, little magazines that charge uh, two hundred and fifty or five dollars, but they tend to be specialty magazines. Most magazines are specialty magazines. Poetry is about poetry. Fiction is about fiction. The art magazines they call them trade journals. They're just about art. Uh, New York Review of Books reviews books, throws in a couple of political articles. I could go on and on and on. Uh, to my mind, there isn't a magazine that tries to deal with uh, the art scene. That is very ambitious, it's true. But as I indicated... Art scene covering all arts. Yes, and, and their interrelationship uh, with each other and the fact that they are now overlapping. People who are working in video, photographers like Dwayne Michaels, writers like Robrier now collaborating with Robert Rauschenberg. Something new is happening. You know, and that nobody is addressing themselves to, as far as I know. Certainly not uh, in a form accessible as this. It's at such an ambitious level and with such, I would say, powerful writers all combining in a single issue. Well, we can intend to continue that. And, to, and uh, we also, as I said, have some of our most exciting work by poets and critics that are largely unknown by the general public. In a brief sentence, how does one how did you get this into this form from an idea into a reality? This has basically been the work of uh, four or five people who uh, donated their labor. And we've already broken even from the ads that we sold. Uh, and the reason people work this hard is because they believed in the idea. I get tremendous encouragement everywhere I went. Uh, people would say, oh, I've been wanting to do this kind of magazine for five or 10 years and uh, I didn't have the money or I didn't dare or I was too busy or whatever. And, uh, you know, I would previously had experience in journalism and, and publishing and uh, I started a, a magazine in Boston, a spin-off of which still exists, uh, that was a little more oriented towards literature. And uh, when I came to New York, uh, I got more involved in the visual arts and I began to see uh, a lot of exciting things were happening that weren't getting exposure, except in isolated sections, you know. Nothing was bringing them together and showing how, uh, you know, they do uh, influence each other. What have you got planned for the second issue? Well, we have uh, a very <laughs> renowned uh, 
critic, Martin Green, who's authored a number of books uh, that got wonderful reviews in the Sunday Times, the last two being uh, the Von Richter von Sisters and Children of the Sun with an essay on Evelyn Waugh. We have a piece by George State, a very uh, hilarious spoof on psychoanalysis. We have Richard Castellanitz um, writing on uh, visual language, new uses of language. Uh, we have uh, poetry by John Ashbery, who's winning National Book Award. And just won it. Just about all of the, all, he's, he's won two major awards, and he'll probably win a few of them. We have uh, Kenneth Koch, who's another very well-known poet. He also uh, won a major book award, uh, National uh, Critics, Book Critics Award, I think they call it. Um, we have interviews uh, with uh, Aaron Copeland and Elliot Carter. Uh, obviously, they both won't appear in the second issue, so we're but keeping our music thing issues. going. Oh, yeah. We'll still have art reviews and book reviews and fictions, regular features. Do you see yourself poetry. just expanding? You have 43 pages and 44 pages 44 in this pages. issue. Well, we'll see. You know, uh, a lot depends. It sounds Speaking like you're mm -hmm. going to get deluged, too, with material. Yeah. Well, we'll see. I hope so. <laughs> it, will, it will all be read, you know, carefully. <laughs> I can assure you. And the address again is, in closing. <laughs> um, 560 Riverside Drive, New York, New York, 10027, New York Arts Journal. And if you want a year subscription, the price is going up to a dollar in September, so if one subscribes now, they get, a, they get a $6 worth of issues for $4. And it's but the checks have to be made payable to Manhattan Arts Review, Inc. And it's published six times a year. That's right. And available on newsstands, in galleries, in bookstores, bookstores, and who knows where else. It's liable to surface wherever anywhere. you find it. <laughs> <laughs> it's a stupendous first issue. Um, I congratulate well, you. Well, listen, thank I, you so much for having me on. I really appreciate it. Recommend it highly. It's uh, making great waves already, and it's just been out a few days. Thank you for watching tonight and being with me and Thank my you, guest, yeah. Richard Bergen. Richard Bergen is the editor of the New York Arts Journal. He also has an impressive literary background. I Richard, guess. look over <laughs> at that camera. <laughs> and we'll both creep in and say good night. <laughs> good night. Thank you for watching. And thank you for having me again. Thank Appreciate you for being here.